Hi, everybody, and welcome once again to Capricorn Radio. This is your host, James Swagger, and I'm delighted to be on my second show today. I just had a fascinating first show, and my second show is even more interesting. It's my favorite subject. It's We're going to be talking about the lost continent of Mew. Um, whether you talk Mew or Atlantis, you have my attention. And uh, we're going to be talking to Jack Churchwood. Um, and he's also going to be talking about James Churchwood, who originally authored a book, um, and Jack has republished it and uh, has been a fellow researcher and carried the flag, as they say. And uh, the book I'm going to be talking about today is Lifting the Veil on the Lost Continent of Mew, the Motherland of Men. And uh, it looks absolutely fascinating. It looks very scholarly and it looks uh, <coughs> it looks it looks at the whole history and paradigm that we've been given and, uh, you know, it ties in several threads together. Um, let me just tell you a bit about James Churchwood. In the 1920s, he wrote a series of groundbreaking books about the lost continent of Lemuria, which we, he called the, law, the land of Mu, uh, M-U, for those not familiar. And the basic premise is that the Garden of Eden was not in Asia. Um, and we're going to leave it at that because James is going to tell us, um, or Jack is going to tell us himself. And uh, without further ado, let's bring on our guest for today. Uh, welcome to Capricorn Radio, Jack. Good afternoon. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here, Jack. And uh, forgive me, I, I can easily mix up a Jack and a James. I'm a James myself, so... <laughs> uh, no, no problem. <laughs> but, um, Jack, your, your grandfather has wrote this book in the 1920s. I guess, you know, give us a double biography, because this is a story of two people, really, J uh, Jack. Um, tell us about James and tell us about you growing up, knowing about your grandfather. And inevitably, tell us about you, too, and... and Kind of tie into both biographies in a way, uh, Jack. Okay. Uh, I was born and raised in Clearwater, Florida, but my great-grandfather was born in Devonshire, England in 1851 and subsequently traveled to the uh, Sri Lanka where he was a tea planter. And in his books, he writes that he was doing famine relief duty and met a rishi of a of a temple there and was examining some of the glyphs and symbols that were on the side of the temple and eventually he became friends with the rishi and the rishi started to teach him more about the symbols and their meanings and whatnot and after their about two years according to james he of being taught the symbols the Rishi finally mentioned that uh, he had some ancient tablets and he mentioned that these the Rishi said that these tablets were from the Nikal Brotherhood which was the uh, they kept the information and wisdom of the people of the lost continent of Mu since its inception 200,000 years earlier and he and James went through the tablets and tried to decipher them and and eventually James wrapped them all back up and repaired them as best he could and they put them away and I guess James when he came back to the United States uh, was fulfilled his his duty as a engineer and whatnot and and gained access to a large amount of funds after he sued a a, a steel company for patent infringement. And this was in the early teens, 1914 uh, or so. And so past that, he was able to re his investigation of the of the Nicole Brotherhood, the lo the legends of the lost continent of Mu. I believe that's when he started putting everything back together. And that became the, the nucleus for his books, The Lost Continent of Mu, Children of Mu, and Cosmic Forces of Mu, and Sacred Symbols of Mu, and, and all his fun books that he wrote. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get into Nicole, because uh, I know Klaus Donna was involved and, and stuff, and I had Klaus on the show quite recently, uh, Jack. But um, you growing up with your great-grandfather then... Uh, Jack, do you, do, obviously, just because you're related to him doesn't mean you're going to have an interest. You obviously have an interest in this stuff too, Jack. So, I mean, tell us about you. I mean, d did you see this guy as a pioneer, as a, a giant of the time? Was it nice to have him in the family history? Was it, you know, were you encouraged or? Actually, it was, it, it was a little bit 
different in my house. My great-grandfather uh, was estranged from my great-grandmother. And my father actually spent summers with my great-grandmother and obviously his father. They lived in the same house, and he was conditioned to uh, believe that everything my great-grandfather wrote was poppycock, as he would say. And whenever his name was mentioned in the house, you know, when I was a young child and people would come up and ask me about his books, I'd come and ask my dad and say, what do you think? What, what are they talking about? And he'd look at me and say, they're talking about foolishness. Don't worry about it. Just stay away from it. And in fact, one story he told me is that when some socialites in the, in the neighborhood found out who his grandfather was, invited him over to this uh, beautiful party, a, a lawn party back then in the 50s, I believe. And they had it catered and everybody was in their finery and they had chauffeurs dropping people off. My grand, my father walked down in his shorts and his t-shirt and his flip-flops and when they finally asked him, you know, he shook hands and said hi. And when they finally asked him, he said uh, what he what he thought of it. And he finally told them the truth. He thought it was all um, um, baloney, but he probably used a different term. And they were not too happy with him. Uh, and I don't think anybody spoke to him any further. And they actually probably asked him, never asked him to come back again. So as far as I was raised, I was raised as a as a as a skeptic. But from all the uh, questions I've been asked and all the uh, interactions I've had with people and things I've seen, I can't, I can't just throw it all out. And so that's what caused me to start researching what my grand grandfather wrote about, uh, uh, researching his life and, and his theories. Wow, that's so interesting, uh, Jack. That's so interesting because you you would naturally think uh, we have this ideal, uh, <laughs> you know, picture when you don't know about somebody what you think that person would be like, or you know, and you could probably forgive me for thinking that, but um, I suppose that kind of gave you a more thorough, more um, academic approach to this, or a more you know a more uh, specific approach that kind of helps you probably better than you, it might have been a burden to be encouraged to research this and to be you know maybe if if your grand great grandfather was idolized for this great research that he did you might have been impaired in a way is what I'm trying to say Jack. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I no, there's no. Uh problem with that with me I, I I'm undertaking it due to the the questions I've been asked and, and the things I've seen that don't that that are not explained with the uh, I have an engineering degree and not everything that I took in engineering is actually explained or the, the things I've seen is not explained by my engineering degree I should say. Well, I'm a fellow engineer too, Jack, and uh, you know this is why I actually do the show because I look into ancient history, uh, and this is what I like about engineers, by the way, uh, Jack. So we're among friends here today, and uh, I have had a few fellow engineers on the show that are also authors and of history and that. But the point is that you know, as an engineer, you're a problem solver. Yeah, you agree with that? And, uh, Absolutely. That and, yeah, that's what the definition is, right? Yeah, you know exactly. So when you when you, I think these are the these are the people we need to look at ancient history, Jack, because you never know what you're going to see. As a, and and I go to a lot of ancient sites, Jack, and and you'll probably agree with this. That you you you'll probably go and see something that the historian doesn't see, or you'll see something that the Egyptologist doesn't see, or you see something that the Mayanologist doesn't see, or you know because you're you you your your thought process is elevated that way yes engineers are creative and yes engineers build things but they're also problem solvers and they that's the core body of it and unless you're in the field you don't realize that um so yeah i can i, I can kind of gel with you on that i, I suppose mm -hmm. i guess then just for the listeners jack the main the, the big one is then just to give us a premise for the lost continent of Mew. i mean from its background its location or um you know well, as my great grandfather wrote, the uh, after discovering these uh, tablets in India in eighteen late eighteen sixties, it told the story of a lost Pacific Ocean continent that was two hundred thousand years or more older, 
and that the people had developed a high level of civilization and they had colonized the earth and essentially all our that that was the garden of eden that all their technologies and their civilization and everything uh, came from there and that's what james uh pinned it back to and the lost continent of Mu, motherland of men, was his attempt to to prove that. And most of the volume is, is provides examples of what he considered proof of a master ancient civilization from which everything else sprung. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So do you know, do you think then that Atlantis was in the Atlantic and that Mu was in the Pacific and they were, they were both sunken continents, or do you perhaps think that one is the other or other one? It, it's some people go, I don't like Mu because I think it, it, Atlantis was the sunken continent, and some people go, I don't like Atlantis, I think it was Mu, and they look at specific evidence for both. Do you think it's probably both are right and both were sunken land masses, or do you think uh, one or the other? Well, as my great-grandfather wrote, he mentioned that Atlantis uh, was a colony of Mu, and that when they went through the Great Inland Sea, through the middle of South America, that's how they got to Atlantis. There was, a, he shows in his books, the children of, in his book, The Children of Mu, the eastern and western uh, roots of, of migration and colonization, and Atlantis was a uh, a colony of Mu, and it sunk under the same cataclysm that uh, took down Mu, as my great grandfather wrote. Sure, sure. You know the, these Nikals are uh, plates. These are incredibly important. I suppose. Uh, tell us what, because Klaus uh, Donna really likes these things as well, doesn't he? He gets quite excited with these Nikal tablets. Um, tell us where you're involved. You've been involved with Klaus, haven't you? Yes, I have. I interacted with him a while ago. When Tell us a little bit about that, uh, Jack. Um, well, he he wrote that uh, a German friend of his, uh, a travel guide that was making trips to India, had wrote, written an article. And in the article, he stated that he had seen the Nikal tablets, or he knew where they were and had pictures of them. And he sent those pictures to me. Wow. And I... I don't want to rain on anybody's parade and 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 be decisive or de- divisive, but the fact is is that the me- metallic plate he he provided pictures of is actually in a Beirut Lebanon museum, and its text has never been um, translated. And the other ones he showed was were some rock tablets that he showed were uh, Tamil. And there had nothing to do with the Nikal Brotherhood or the Nikal tablets. Mm-hmm. Wow, wow! But why are they in the Lebanon Museum then? I, they were found in Lebanon. They're they're not from. They they weren't the. They're not the Nikal tablets, or they weren't. Right. Or they're not. But are they or, in uh, writing for that region? Are they in that type of script? Well, the the particular script that there sh- that is on there, I don't believe has been uh, deciphered. D- deciphered yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I got you. Wow. You know, I, I think the beauty about uh, Mew or Atlantis or both, uh, as your uh, great grandfather said, you know, is that like this this really this idea of a sunken landmass, whether that's one or two or both. Um, you know, this really ties in all this global evidence, Jack, this, uh, you know, these global threads of evidence where you see similarities popping up in all sorts of cultures. Um, you know, is that the way you see, you see all this, you see that as the main question mark, you know, that everything can be answered when you bring in a lost continent. I'm I'm not, uh, convinced I'm, I'm like I mentioned previously. I'm still researching his works to to determine the the veracity of them. I understand that there yeah there are similarities between peoples, and it would be nice to have proof positive. And I'm not sure that 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 has been shown 100%. I know there's there's circumstantial evidence, but 
that, that doesn't prove anything in a court of law, according to what I've heard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been to uh, Devonshire, by the way, just out of curiosity? Uh, negative. No. Oh, yeah, I used to live there, by the way. I used to live in uh, Devon. I, it's a beautiful part of the world. Absolutely beautiful. Like, you know, um, uh, a lot of authors and stuff live there, by the way. <laughs> just, well, I'd, I'd love to go, and yeah. uh, hopefully that's in the, in the cards someday. Yeah, rich in megaliths and rich in, uh, you know, culture and rich in um, from music to arts to creativity. You know, seem, seemingly people flock there, like, you know, so strange, well, our, strange that your great-grandfather left there and that's what it become like, so. Well, our uh, ancestral home in Stoke Gabriel, and uh, it's called Hill House, before it was sold last century by Charlie Churchward, it was the... Uh, I believe the oldest private home in 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 Britain. Wow! Yeah, we've got documents that show that the the land and the property was from the fourteen something or other fourteen twenty something. Wow! Are you from a big family then, uh, Jack? Is there is there anybody else in the family that takes an interest in your great grandfather's work, or is it just you? Uh, it's just me. I'm the uh, other of my son. Um, mm-hmm who's in India right now studying wow. at a monastery. I'm the last remaining church ward wow. of, of this particular line. There are other church wards, but not... they're not descended from James. Oh, oh. so interesting. Like, um, do you see this important for you then to, to understand this lost continent of Mu? Or do you see this as sort of importance for him? Uh, I personally see anybody who's researching history today of ancient cultures and especially engineers or astronomers or whoever, you're like, you know, do you see this as important to getting to the truth of history and humanity? Well, I think it's very important to make sure that you get the history down right and that you provide facts rather than sometimes uh, wild postulations or or. Uh, you're reaching for straws sometimes. Sometimes they reach for straws, and what the what is stated doesn't follow what the conclusion is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that about a lot of political writing as well. And oh yeah, more so. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, see, so your grandfather talked about the biblical Eden was in the specific, like he literally, the Garden of Eden was in the specific ocean, not in Asia as we think it is. Um, I think that's the biggest point to make of all. But I think people would like to think that they have it narrowed down, um, Jack. But like, I, I don't see the evidence for narrowing it down, by the way, in Asia. I think a lot of fanciful and people trying to tie it together and, but, um, uh, what, what records do we have of it being in, like, Pacific or of any? Well, James had quite a few different um, examples that he had of where of of Mu. Uh, he well, he mentioned all the megalithic structures, yeah, uh, structures that are that are found in um, the the Pacific. Like Nan Madal, and he mentioned there are some on uh, Hawaii. Padang as well. Is it Kun Padang? And then there's all the dolmens in Korea. I've been invited to go to Korea as well, funny enough, Jack. But yeah, and people don't realize that Indonesia and Asia is riddled with the stuff, like riddled with it. Absolutely. Um, Nan Madal, I mean, there's a place there now. I mean, I've had an author on talking about Nan Madal before. A few people have touched on this, and. Uh, I mean, Nan Madal is, is like, you know, it's like the smoking gun, if you ask me, uh, Jack. Well, it would be, unless, uh, if you disregard the uh, oral traditions of the people that live there, and the archaeological evidence that indicates that these were built within the last thousand years. I understand that people don't are a little uh, amazed that they can bring these enormous basalt crystals They've actually found basalt crystals on another on the other side of the island, and I believe I've seen a couple of TV shows that indicated that they were able to present day take one of these enormous basalt crystals and put it in one of their little reed boats and and bring it over there. Really, I haven't seen that. That's interesting. 
It's, it, it is incredibly, incredibly massive structure, though, whether the antiquity of it is in question or not. I mean, the, the, the sheer size, this is, the, this is a man-made, just for the listeners, for the way, Jack, Namadal is literally like a man-made structure. It's actually like an island. It's like an island of basalts. It goes under the ocean as well as above it. Uh, and they're like, they're basically like railway sleepers made out of bits of stone, basalt stone, um, all stacked on top of each other. Like, well, massive, like nearly as big as the pyramid, if not bigger in, in, in volume, I think. It's quite large. Mm. You know, um, wow, still a lot of work to do by uh, reed boats, though, Jack. Mm hmm. It probably took them a long time. Wow, for sure. Um, you know, I hadn't heard about that as a recent structure, though. I haven't really heard that. I know there's a lot of mythology about uh, it being um, possessed by entities and they won't go over there at nighttime or stay over on the island and stuff like, you know. It's like one of the most report remote places on the planet, like, and uh, French Polynesia. But, um, Fascinating place, though. Fascinating place. Um, what records do we have of Mew, then? Talk to me about some of the records that we got, Jack. Well, James mentions quite a bit in his books, and he provides, like, 21 specific uh, references of the South Sea Island uh, ruins that he discovered. Um, well, um... Easter Island, uh, Tongu Tebu, who, which he puts in his, he wrote a, he made a picture of one of the standing, some of the standing stones there. Uh, he mentions Uxmal in, in the Yucatan. And that, it, that well, he mentions several of, he mentioned several of the Mayan ruins as being uh, from Mu and uh, Burma. The Cook Islands, the Gilbert and Marshall Islands, the Caroline Group in uh, Pohnpei is one of his big examples and used by quite a few people. Mm. Wow. Wow. He also writes about the Egyptian Book of the Dead and the sacred volume and stuff. And I guess that's one big one for me because I, I research into Egypt a lot and I've had a lot of Egyptologists on the show. But tell us where this fits in and, and, and what the importance of this is, uh, Jack. Well, James' interpretation of the Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which was written on the side of walls in the in the tomb and also on papyri, James interpreted that to be a monument or a commemoration. His interpretation was that it was a commemoration of the lands to the west that had sunk. Because he noticed that, they, actually he noticed that there's two divisions in, in Egypt. That some of the people talk about the lands to the east and some talk about the lands to the west. That's right, yeah. And his interpretation was, well, the ones from the east, uh, the lands of the east, those are the people that came from Mu. And directly through, through India and uh, the Levant and whatnot. And the other, on the other side, the lands from the west, these are the people that came through the inland sea in South America and touched, stopped off at Atlantis and then entered the Mediterranean Sea and continued on to Egypt. He believed there was two, two different uh, instances of, of migration, colonization. Sure. I mean, the Egyptians themselves, I mean, when you read the, the Plato's account of Atlantis, they talk about, which he got from the Egyptians, and uh, m maybe he gave the name Atlantis, you know, but you no, know, he could. they could have been talking about two continents or one. He maybe just slapped a label on it as Atlantis. And do um, you think then that, like, these guys were talking about the motherland of men in general, and, and Plato maybe just put Atlantis on it, and we only, because a lot of people kind of run with the Atlantis team, and then they don't really you know what Mu is, whereas you know the Egyptians could have been talking about you know, as you say, like the the, the east and the west, like these two these two uh, homelands. Well, I I believe that um, if you look at the Egyptian account, they might not be have gone back and far as far in time as James did, and so the the fact that there is a people that lived on Atlantis. They might not have been aware that there was people 
from Mu and that the Mu was the original place where those people came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, are you familiar with the Kumash art and the in the painted caves in in Santa Barbara, the far west? Uh, negative. Wow, because uh, I just happened to know about this, and when I read the book, uh, I, I got to uh, New the Empire of the Sun, chapter six, and as soon as I opened it, I went, "Oh my god!" Because I, I I've, I've been studying rock art and cave art. It's just a little hobby I have. Don't think I'll ever write a book on it, but <laughs> I'll, uh, I I love ancient uh, cave art and and the art of the Kumash. Uh, painted cave in Santa Barbara in uh, California is exactly like what's in your father's book or sorry your great grandfather's book um, mm -hmm. the, the circle with the, the the star or the sun inside it um, with the eight points on it um, which is also similar to megalithic art in Ireland but um, but the, the empire of the sun I guess I suppose let's bring in the symbology then and, and the symbols that, that 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 the empire of the sun is that you know this is a common source and I I just think that it's beautifully located um again there's so many examples of this Jack though there's so many examples of these little pieces of art that are separated in time and separated in history and separated in geographics that all tie in with a common source but you know we're not allowed to think like that in a way, Jack. You're not allowed to think your mainstream academia does not let you think that we all had a common source. So, of course, we have to dismiss it. But I just think it's so fitting that it's in uh, California. Um, well, according to the individuals, um, uh, Mr. Cerves, in his book, Liberia, the lost continent of, uh, of, of, he believed, he also in there in, in mentions that it, that the Lost continent of of Lemuria was the original records refer to it as Mu, but in that book, uh, and in James never mentioned Lemuria, but and he never mentioned Mister Survey's work, but in that book they mentioned that uh, the continent of of Lemuria cr uh, bashed up against California, and the, and the, the ensuing mountains between the two of them is a dividing line and. What's west of that is is what the remains of Lemuria, and to the right, it's uh, okay, it's uh, America. So as as according to surveys, maybe those are from uh, the lost continent of Lemuria, as he mentioned. Mm. Well, I I think the art has been dated. Don't ask me how they've dated this, by the way. Um, I, it could be just pulled out of a hat, but uh, I think it's six thousand years old. But that kind of leads into the next question then. What time frame? I know James has talked a lot about the uh, geological time frames and and Mew, you know, give us a time frame on what James thinks and give us a time frame on what you think or do you agree? Um, well, I, I he mentioned twelve to fourteen thousand years ago. It it varies among where you find his work, but that more or less corresponds to the end of the last ice age. Yeah, yeah, and that could. And there are there are so many variables in there that we don't know, really know what land was above the sea, or if the conditions are correct or proper to allow individuals, scientists, researchers to discover anything from those ruins, or if there was anything there. Wow. Yeah, you know, it's such an important time on our planet as well, um, Jack. Just an important time. I mean, so much animals got wiped out. The, the melting ice sheets. We pretty much have a geological understanding of what happened. There was a flood. There was cataclysms on the earth. Animals were dying off. You know, that was an important time frame for our history of our planet. Um, you know, if it, it, it's kind of funny that you know your great grandfather as well as Plato as well as anybody else they they seem to have picked a time that really 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 fits um jack mhm mm um you know it's like uh you know it, 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 you, you couldn't guess it better really is what i'm trying to say jack well i'm i'm not sure what i'm like i said i'm still researching and trying to to, to find the answers and uh, I, I'm not. I can't come out and say for sure anything exactly. But I'm. I'm still working on it. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's the way to be. I suppose to be thorough, like um, to be thorough. Um, 
let, let's talk about some of the symbols, Jack. I mean, there's a lot of symbols used across the planet. Um, I mean, the Dogon, they use the same sun wheel as the ancient Egyptians, and these sun wheels are, are typical of um, some of the stuff that your great-grandfather goes into. Um, but that's just one example. I mean, um, do you see these symbols as, a, as an important piece of evidence then? Well, being... I, I what I've attempted to do in my research is to go through individually his books and uh, the first one is done the second one is to the to the printer the stone tablets of Mu it's tentatively called and contains his 1927 book on the lost the the tablets that he obtained copies of from William Niven uh, that that showed ancient buried cities in Mexico City his uh, subsequent books like the children of Mu, I'm going to eventually get into that and, and the symbols. I have yet to, to really look at the symbols other than attempt to compare them to some things that have been found in archaeological digs and whatnot and see if there is any correlation between them. But as far as a deep uh, study of his symbols, no, I have, I'm not there yet. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, I- Tell us about how North America fits into all this then, because um, North America, as as far as anyone, I mean, as far as anyone in the modern world, we were only, up until about 20 years ago, we were only allowed to believe that Columbus discovered America and nothing happened before that, but that's not really the case, I suppose, um, Jack, but uh, either from yourself or, or from James, I mean, tell us how North America fits into all this, these ancient civilizations are going back to moon. Like, well, well, as James mentioned, his the the colonists, I guess from the eastern, uh, some of them went through the inland sea in the, in the South America and continued on to Africa and to Europe and to Atlantis, but some people went and colonized the Yucatan, colonized the uh, North America. James believed that uh, that the cataclysms that he witnessed in Mr. Niven's articles when he wrote about the 2,000 tablets he found in the Valley of Mexico, James believed those were evidence of that as well. It showed uh, proof positive. Uh, the petroglyphs that uh, are spread out all across the, the North America are mentioned in his books as proof. And James believed that the people in North America were descended from the the moon, well as everyone else is and i and i believe that is one part of his books that when you look at his theories and, and immediately dismiss that no there was no sunken gun and, and no i don't believe that and as soon as you throw all that information out and dismiss it the underlying theme that that in the end of uh, james believed that there was actual we all actually had the same beginning, that, that we have a common answer, ancestor, and that we all lived together in peace and harmony and were tolerant of each other for thousands of years. And, and somehow after the collapse of the civilization, savagery ensued. Mm-hmm. How, so, Sorry. sorry yeah. How do, how do Native American Indians um, take to this? Uh, do any of them indulge in this work, or do they have the same belief that they have? Like, like a, do they talk about a lost land like Mu or a common uh, motherland or anything like that? Well, I have mentioned, uh, James does mention that there are relatives, um, there are accounts in the uh, in some of the tribes that indicate that these people did come from someplace else. Hmm. Wow. I haven't engaged that uh, entirely. Sure, sure. Uh, it would be very hard to prove as well. I mean, you would have to common. You'd have to. You'd have to do a lot of research for individual tribes and see commonality. And um, I know there is a lot of mythology. I don't like even use the word mythology myself, um, Jack, because uh, one person's mythology is another person's history. But. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, I think there's a lot of common mythology stroke history among a lot of tribes in uh, North America. Um, I guess, tell us about the buried cities, the Mexican buried cities that Niven talked about, because this is important as well. And you'd already mentioned Mexico, so. Well, James mentioned uh, 
in, in the first book, in the 1926 Lost Continent of Moo, Motherland of Men, he devoted an entire chapter of the book Buried Cities, um, Niven's Buried Mexican Cities. Mm-hmm. And he described, uh, he actually included an article by William Niven in the book, and plus his own commentary and, and beliefs in it as well. But Niven had found in throughout his excavations in Mexico, especially in the Valley of Mexico, he had found what he believed to be an enormous city mm. uh, with concrete walls mm-hmm. that was so old that the wood that was used had been petrified. Right, yeah, yeah. And he had found examples of high technology, such as uh, a jeweler's uh, set up with an oven and all this, and it was the... the the molds were extremely tiny, so they had an advanced civilization in that they were they were able to provide people the opportunity to sit down and do jewelry instead of uh, food production or or security or or whatever. Extracurricular to civilization, as we would think at that time, I suppose. Yes, as well. He he found, uh, I believe. Uh, one location where there were hundreds of small statuettes that represented individuals that those people shouldn't have been able to know they were they were African people and uh, Indians uh, from India Indians and uh, Chinese and all kinds of different peoples they found in one of the locations of one of the digs all these little statues so in addition to having a high level of civilization where they were allowed the opportunity to have free time. They also, uh, it appeared, had commerce because obviously they just didn't make up these people. If they look like that, they obviously uh, interacted with individuals that looked like that. We also have the Olmec heads that are have Negroid features as well. and um, So that's another anomaly as well of uh, the Americas. Um, Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Like, you know, if you have statues of uh, foreign people that, you know, these were commercial trading pieces as well as uh, artistic expression, I suppose. Quite possibly. Mm. You know, the the thing as well that you mentioned, the jewelers and the metallurgy is, from what I gather, they they were doing like platinum and gold jewelry. And and platinum, as you know, as an engineer, Jack, but for the listeners, it's such a high melting point. You know, it's like uh, extremely hard to be doing working with platinum and gold together. And uh, a lot of the, I think Ecuador has some uh, stuff as well around uh, the platinum and, and gold um, face masks and stuff. But um, that's the bit that I find fascinating that we can use science today, Jack, to look into the past and and, and scratch our heads a, a high technology. Well, uh, I all the big movements of rocks and things. Um, I hate to reckon back to this, but for instance, the Crystal Palace we have here in in Florida, where an individual from, I believe it was Lithuania, came and took these enormous blocks of stone and moved them all around. One story is that when he had to move it ten miles down the road, he'd he'd call in for the pickup, the the tractor trailer to come in, and he'd ask them to take the night off. And in the morning, when they came back, all these enormous rocks oh, were Scal- on the tractor trailer. Yeah, Elite Scotland and Coral Castle. Yeah. Yes. What a fascinating uh, place that is. Fascinating story in terms of, uh, and, and I guess this is probably similar to yourself, when you're researching a figure in history, you know, you might expect it this and you might expect that, but uh, I, I think Leeds Gallen, he moved it because he first of all built that castle uh, out of all these corals and stuff. Uh, he balanced all these stones that were... You know, precariously balanced and, and, you know, weighing many, many tons like, and he was a tiny guy. He was only like five foot, if that, and uh, from, I think, Lithuania, as you say, he was a tiny little man. He couldn't have lifted very much weight, never mind the many tons that these stones are. But I think he built it for his girlfriend, Agnes, uh, who stood him up or something, and then he ended up moving the place. Mm-hmm. And like you say, uh, he he brought a truck in, told the truck driver to go, and 
moved the whole place many miles. Uh, but uh, what a fascinating story that is, too, Jack. Like, um, well, and in in addition to that, uh, there's an individual in, I believe, Wisconsin, wow. who has also showed that he is able to move enormous two, three, four, five ton blocks all by himself. Wow, really? And set them up upright and move them and whatnot. Wow. That's how fascinating. I'll have to look into this. Um, I hadn't heard that before. Um, yeah, you, you know, he, he, your great-grandfather talks about the Yucatan and, and how these guys were placed among ancient civilizations. And for me, I mean, the Yucatan is a special place because they think that was also the the, the place where it killed the dinosaurs because there's a big giant crater there. So, I mean, this this place is fascinating for many, many reasons, like uh, all within, the, I mean, the, the pyramids as well and uh, stuff like, you know, it's a, it's a geologically and historically and astronomy and stuff that's there. It's, it's, it's been fascinating for many, many uh, eons. But um, tell us what your grandfather thought of the Yucatan. A great well, he, he believed... Um, that it was obviously a, a colony, and he got that, I guess, from from uh, Augustus Le Plochon, who believed uh, that that was the uh, beginning. That was where civilization started. And I guess there were another, a few uh, authors that and researchers at the time that believed the same. But James believed that it was, um, sure, just a colony. Yeah, this is the thing that you got to understand when you look at your great grandfather's work. That you know, as you say, colony is the key word, Jack. Like that, these places are all colonies from a common source. The common source is gone now. This um, sunken landmass. Do, do you look into why that sunken landmass is gone? Do you? Well, as far as when James placed it in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, I, I I'm an engineer and. I really kind of believe what they're saying about plate tectonics mm -hmm. and find it a bit during the last 10, uh, 12, 14,000 years, it would be on the scale of what James wrote. I believe that the lost continent of Mu was probably not in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Now, if you look at, at a different scale, that's possible that there was a, there's a sunken island. On a different scale, I mean, I'm not talking about the entire uh, Pacific Ocean Basin or, or a large part of it as he wrote. Or if you look at the uh, su subsidence of, of seawater during the last, uh, at the end of the last ice age, that is another possibility yeah. that I, I subscribe to. Mm -hmm. But there's there's choices there. Um, unfortunately, I really can't subscribe to the fact that it was a all the way through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the most fascinating things in the whole of the book um, is that your grandfather writes about the origin of savagery and that savagery has uh, come out of civilization, that man was created civilized first and that being civilized, savagery came out of civilization. You know, I quite understand that. And I don't just like that concept, I actually quite understand that. You know, you, you look at what we're like today, in the more civilized quote, I should say, quote civilized that we have become, the more savage and barbaric, you know, especially Western nations. Um, not pointing out anybody in particular, Jack, but I mean, um, do you understand that philosophy? Do you see that that was an important uh, point point of your great grandfather's work? I I look at it um, from the point of view that his understanding is that the creator made humans as a special creation and en endowed them with special powers. Mm -hmm. These special powers got them through 200,000 years, according to James, and that one day uh, everything dropped out from under them. And the only thing they could, I mean, they didn't have, I guess they didn't have what they needed to, to continue their existence, or they didn't believe they had what they needed to continue their existence and thereupon they set upon their neighbor when they got hungry or and um, everyone was reduced to savagery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he talks about religion as well maybe just bring that in and, and that the ancient religious uh, philosophies or concepts or ideology um, and how that affects man and stuff 
Well, James uh, James believed that the Nikal Brotherhood, who who were the keepers of wisdom and knowledge, captured that religion, but. Their religion was different in that their religion completely fused with science. They they believed that, well, their religion was science and their science was religion and everyone was taught along those lines as opposed to, and no one had any differences or disagreements, which also helped for people being, treating each other nicely and being tolerant. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, he also wrote about ancient sac- sacred mysteries, rites, and ceremonies. Um, you know, and that these are like incredibly important as well. And 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 I think you what you say is that these ceremonial rites, and religious and science, it was just one big circular wheel, Jack. That you know, it was like one blended into the other, into the other. Like, but I mean, um, maybe talk about the, the rites and the ceremonies and how important that they were. Well, well, James' discussion of those, I believe he understood that they were com- uh, commemorations of the Mu, of their 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 seed of civilization, the Garden of Eden, and these rites were to help uh, remember that it existed, so that perhaps they could hearken back to it to a better time and eventually get back there as a species. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked yet. <laughs> it totally, Jack. You know, that was my last question because we're coming to the top of the hour. I wanted to kind of touch it in where, where we are today with research into Mu. Now, I know, not taking away from you, Jack, I know you're looking at this and um, I'm glad you have done and, 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 and you know, um, you, your great-grandfather's work could have easily just been lay, lay forgotten, I suppose. Uh, and, and it makes me wonder how many other authors that out there, their, their work dwindles in a way. But, I mean, uh, is there anybody else carrying the flag for Moo research? Is this, do you see this as important? Do you see this as something that, you know, we need to get more people on the case like? And, uh, and you well, s- I'm, I'm, not well, I'm not aware of other individuals who are studying it. I know there are some other individuals that, uh, that are looking into it. And I don't know uh, if I can out them or what not, because some people still consider it kook and fringe theories. But my thought is we're we're on on the path, and it's possible for us to get back to where we were. And all this fighting and uh, ridiculous intolerance of each other is is counterintuitive or is it's it's counter to what we're, where we should be headed counterproductive counterintuitive counter humanitarian <laughs> i mean mm-hmm. that list goes on jack i mean for you what would be the biggest area of research into mu that we could focus on i mean whether that's you know as an engineer one that we can get answers on or one that you think is more philosophically better to look at i mean um in, in the recent talk I gave, I, I provided uh, some thoughts, and the fact is, is that it would, first of all, if we could find the Nicole tablets, that would be great. But if we found them or identified some tablets as, uh, as the Nicole tablets, how could we know how to decipher them without a member of the Nicole Brotherhood or, or a learned person that could decipher them for us? And then what will we do if those people still didn't want to be discovered? Because obviously if they were around and they wanted to be known, they could easily, easily do that today. But if they didn't want to be found, how would we find one of them? And so we'd have to, and then again, if they didn't want to be found, if you, if you decided you wanted to try to find them, if they didn't want to be found, I don't think you would be able to find them. Sure. So then it, it, it behooves me to, to look into what James wrote about his cosmic forces of Mu, which ties the science and, and religion together and how he envisioned the universe worked. That, I believe, will be one of my uh, things that I'll need to study in the future so that I can understand the cosmic forces. And perhaps if I can understand them, maybe some of the Nicole tablets that have been shown or some of the, uh, I'll be able to understand them better. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Wow, wow. You know, I, I would love as an engineer as well, Jack, to get back to some of that ancient technology, that lost science, like uh, as the engineer, obviously, um, I don't think we could ever get that. But I think that's a bit fanciful. I mean, oh, you know, I think we could rediscover it in our own personal discoveries. But I mean, I don't think we're going to dig something up and go, oh, we know how to do this again. Um, I don't well, think- I'm, I'm right there with you. I understand that. Yeah, yeah. But if we can understand what he wrote in the Cosmic Forces, and I've I've tried to read it once or twice, mm-hmm. but my engineering brain just yeah kind of dismissed it all the first time, and I'm just gonna have to take a different tact on it and try to understand what he is saying. Yeah, you know, that's the beautiful thing about engineers. They'll put it down, they'll go back and have another look at it, and they'll try a different approach. As you know, and I've dabbled in physics and science as well, and and I think science scientists struggle where engineers can can excel, but um, and vice versa for that matter. Not not to have a go at scientists. I, I think the thing to point out is that these guys. Um, in the lost continent, you or Atlantis are back in deep, deep antiquity, uh, Jack, is that these guys had a much different philosophy and uh, they were all about knowledge and preserving knowledge and encouraging knowledge and, and uh, you know, when things fell, things fell, like, and we've lost something very precious, I think, Jack. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I guess the thing to probably finish on then is like, you know, um, you know, encourage you for what you're doing and, and encourage the research, you know, because we're getting an insight into something that probably would be forgotten about. But I, I think, yeah, I think your great grandfather was onto something. I think he was a pioneer in this time, uh, Jack. I think he really, really was a pioneer. Um, well, a lot of people consider him that. Yeah, I do. I certainly do from looking at the work. That I mean, you, you got to understand at the time he wrote this book too, Jack. You know, he wouldn't. He would have stood out a mile. <laughs> he would have stood out a mile. You know, um, but he, yeah, he must have been like uh, he's he's on a par with me for uh, Ignatius Donnelly, who wrote Atlantis in uh, eighteen ninety first edition. Mm-hmm. Um, he was just a comparative of of uh, Ignatius Donnelly in a way, um, just writing about the other Atlantis or the other the other continent, that of Mu. Um, Tell me about you, Jack. Then, uh, do you do many conferences? Do you do? Have you anything to come up to? Any con- and anything that you want to mention or uh, your website? And uh, you have a YouTube channel as well, I think. That's correct. I uh, my website actually to get to my links, if a uh, link to all my to my Facebook page, YouTube, uh, my blogs and whatnot. It's j. dot churchward. dot com. Oh, that's quite simple. Churchwood.com. J.churchwood.com. Oh, that's easy. Well, I'm going to, yeah, sorry, I'm going to link that up on the YouTube channel and on the, on the biography page as well for the listeners in the uh, archives as well. Um, and you have a conference coming up? I I hope to, uh, to attend my uh, publisher's conference in, I believe it's in June or July. But I also uh, have a conference coming up in September in Colorado at the uh, Sunrise Ranch with the uh, Emissaries of Divine Light and they're going to be doing a a conference on Lemuria. That sounds interesting. Um, I think I know about that. Uh, A lady, because I've had two people stay with me from Colorado and one of them mentioned that they they have a conference up there. Um, It's 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 like a spiritual retreat on the edge of a... it's in a nice setting up there. Um, I haven't been there yet but they tell me it's nice and I've seen pictures so it it appears to be, but that'll be sometime in early September, I believe. Well, the book is called "Lifting the Veil on the Lost Continent of Mu: The Motherland of Men" by Jack Churchwood, and it's available at Ozark Mountain Publishing. Um, of course, you'll probably get it on Amazon and all the usual book dealers. Uh, and if they go to my bookstore on my website, I have I will I have signed copies available. Signed copies at jchurchwood.com. Yeah. J dot churchward.com yes j.churchward.com okay and there's a link to the bookstore there wow beautiful i love signed copies myself jack like if i can get a signed copy that's the version i want um all righty but uh, you know it's been a pleasure having you on the show and uh, you know keep up the research uh, jack really do you know it's like uh, i think your great grandfather was like, like i say he's a pioneer and a titan of his day and uh, you know he left a he left a library of uh, volumes there for people to um 
you know, carry the flag. And and I think, you know, it's 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 sad that and like it's kind of escaped a lot of people for so long. But I think we're in the right paradigm now, Jack. Well, look, thank you for having me on, James. Yeah, it's been thank a, you for your time. It's been a pleasure, Jack. Thank you very much. Take care, brother. Alrighty. Bye now.